O-H. You can do better than that. O-H. Hi, everybody. I'm Burton Melnick, and I am the university's chief wellness officer and dean of the College of Nursing. This is one awesome turnout for this event. Now, all of you know we're number one in football now, right? Yeah. Our dream is to be number one in wellness, the healthiest university on the planet. And our third dream is to be the leading university in interprofessional education and practice. So we have comprised the most awesome leadership team in an interprofessional education and practice collaborative. It's comprised of key leaders across all of your colleges who since 2012 have been meeting regularly to plan activities to advance interprofessional education and practice. In August, we held the first IPEP collaborative that drew 800 students. Today, we topped that goal by 902 students. So give yourselves a hand, it's phenomenal. So at the end of tonight, here's what we want you to achieve. One, to discuss best practices in disclosing medical errors, describe key strategies for apologizing. Apologizing is critical when errors are made, but doing it as a team really helps the situation, and that's what we're doing tonight. And lastly, we're focused on the IPEP competencies, which are teamwork, interprofessional communication, values, ethics, roles, and responsibilities, and evidence-based practice. Our agenda, is we will be having our terrific guest speaker first. That will be followed by case discussions at your tables, followed by an interprofessional panel. I would first like to thank the team that planned this very character-building situation tonight. Uh, Jackie Hollins and the staff from my college, Michelle Harka from vet Veterinary Medicine, Ryan Nash from Medicine, Lynn Gilliger Ford from Nursing. So help me give them a round of applause. <laughs> now, we call team building at first character building, because you do go through a lot of bumps on the way to building good interprofessional teams. So I'm going to show you a clip right now from Cool Runnings. It's a true story about a Jamaican bobsled team. And look at the character builders they go through initially when they're forming this particular team. And this is a true story. Please roll the clip. One thing, the push start. Now I know you dainty little track stars think you're fast. Well, <laughs> let's see how fast you are when you push a 600 pound sled. Now a respectable start time is 5.7 seconds. If you speed demons can't whip off an even six flat, then you have a better chance of becoming a barbershop quartet. Oh. 14-3, no 
good. 13-5, 11-7. This is what it's all about. This is where you win or lose the race. Right here in the push start. This is where you're gonna practice. Right here, right here in the bolt wagon. You're gonna practice. Go, Junior. Put the ball down. Come on, hustle. Catch up with him. There you go. Junior. No. Do it again. Very good. Right again. So that's what teams often go through at first. A lot of character builders, a lot of miscommunication. But we're really committed to building strong interprofessional teams here. And that's what tonight is all about. So I'd like to introduce Michelle Harka right now. She is Director of Professional Development Education in VetMed. And she will be introducing our guest speaker. Great, thank you, Byrne. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight, and, and let's give a round of applause to the facilitators at each of these tables. They're giving up our, their evening to be with you and to help educate you, so thank you very much for volunteering and saying yes. So Doug Wojcicic is founder of SariWorks, the leading disclosure training organization in the United States. Doug has personally trained over 30,000 healthcare, insurance, and legal professionals in disclosure principles. The SariWorks book co-authored by Doug, and two medical malpractice defense attorneys has sold over 25,000 copies and has been translated into Japanese and Korean. The Sari Works website receives over 500 unique visitors per day, and the Sari Works e-newsletter is read by thousands of healthcare, insurance, and legal professionals on a weekly basis. Doug developed his passion for teaching disclosure after losing his brother to medical errors in a Cincinnati hospital. Please join me in welcoming Doug Wojcicic. Thanks. Thank you. Well, good evening. Let's try that again. Good evening. Can you hear me in the back? Am I good back there? Okay. Well, I always start my presentations by saying thank you, because I know at 5.40 on a Tuesday evening, uh, there's a lot of other things you could be doing. Uh, to the students, I say thank you. This is a terrific turnout. I know this is an exceptionally busy time in your lives, both in your education uh, as well as personally. So I really appreciate your time, and uh, thank you for that. And I'm going to work really hard over the next 40 to 45 minutes to make this something that is valuable for you, not just for today. Uh, but for the rest of your careers. This issue is that important because no matter how well they train you here at The Ohio State University, you will have adverse medical events in your practice. Some will even be your own fault or the fault of your team. Many will be no one's fault, but you're gonna have an upset patient and family and you yourself will be upset as well. And you need to know how to deal with that. I also wanna say thank you to the faculty and staff, the leadership here uh, at the school you all are very busy teaching these students as well as researching and publishing and serving on committees and consulting and whatever else you do. So I thank you for your time. I'm going to hopefully impart some information that you can reinforce uh, with these students when you get back in the classrooms and the clinics and wherever else. This issue is that important. I got into, uh, as Michelle said, I got into this issue uh, not by choice or it wasn't the design for my life, what, what I envisioned but it was God's plan, I suppose. My oldest brother, Jim, died from medical errors in May of 1998 in a Cincinnati, Ohio hospital. Jim went into a Cincinnati, Ohio hospital at two o'clock in the morning complaining of chest, shoulder, neck, and stomach pain. So severe, got him out of bed at two o'clock in the morning. And you have to understand, Jim was a big, burly, tough guy, kind of guy that got asked to play football. Uh, so, you know, he comes in the emergency room, he's, he's all buff and, you know, good looking and 39 years old and the doctors automatically assumed well, look at you, you're built like a brick house, must be something wrong with your stomach. To which my brother replied, yeah I'm either having the worst case of heartburn in my life or I'm having a heart attack. Well 
they ran him back, they, they, did, so they did an EKG, they found or they heard a murmur in the heart, and my brother said, I've never had a murmur as far as I know in my life, and again, the doctors basically said, look at you, you're built like a brick house, must be something wrong with your stomach. <clears throat> they gave him an ulcer cocktail for a couple hours and sent him home. Still in excruciating pain. They never drew blood that night. The next morning, my parents brought him back to that very same hospital. They had to bring him back because he was starting to pass out. The oxygen levels in his blood were going that low. So they get him in, back in the same emergency room. They, this time they do the blood test. Sure enough, the enzyme is in the blood showing the heart muscles are in distress or being damaged. They get him into ICU. And this is where the holes of Swiss cheese started to line up, as we say, in patient safety. The computer monitor over my brother Jim's bed, or my brother Jim's bed read Ray Wachesik. My brother's name was Jim. The computer monitor read Ray Wachesik. Who's that? That's our father. Very significant because Dad had had a heart stress test done at this very same hospital just a couple months prior to my brother's passing. My dad had a clean stress test. So fast forward a couple months, there's my dad looking at a computer monitor with his name on it, but his old son in the bed, he went and got the doctors. They wanted to argue, argue with him about who was who. Dad had to pull a driver's license to prove identities. Well, they eventually changed the computer monitor to read Jim Wachesik, but not before they were using my dad's charts. So he diagnosed my brother with a bacterial infection of the heart. For two days, they plugged him full of antibiotics. Mid on Tuesday, died on a Thursday. Last afternoon of his life, he was going downhill, he was swollen up, he was spitting up blood, he was in excruciating pain. They ran him down the hall to run a probe up his leg, see if they'd missed something around the heart. Sure enough, when they got in there, they found several arteries were blocked. He crashed during the test and died in emergency open heart surgery. The staff, the doctors, the nurses, the leadership of that hospital had no idea how to handle my family. They had no idea how to communicate with us. They had no idea how to stay engaged, how to fix our problems, both financial and emotional. They basically just ran away and hid, hoping we would forget about it. We didn't. My parents filed a medical malpractice lawsuit. Let me tell you, folks, it wasn't a lottery ticket. It wasn't fun. It wasn't silly like you see in some of the political battles. It was heart-wrenching. My mother was deposed by two very aggressive defense lawyers, so much so she was sobbing. And her lawyer, our lawyer said, stop, guys, let's give Mrs. Wachesica a break. And without missing a beat, one attorney turned to the other and started talking about their kids' soccer games. Like he, my dad wanted to strangle them. Mercifully, after a year and a half, the judge turned to the doctors and nurses in the hospital and said, hey, guys, come on, who are you kidding? You committed malpractice. You killed this young man. Take care of this family. The opening offer in the case was 1500 bucks. At that point, the judge became furious and said, get out of my chambers. I told you to take care of these people. Don't rip them off. Well, we got a pretty sizable settlement after the back and forth. And you know, after we signed the liability waiver so we couldn't sue anymore, the attorneys, not the doctors, not the nurses, not any of the health care professionals, the attorneys said sorry, but it was just empathy. There was no apology, no admission of fault, no explanation of what went wrong and how they're going to fix it so it wouldn't happen again. So even though we got money, which everyone thinks the stuff's about, we really didn't get the emotional closure we sought. But I've often thought about those doctors and nurses, you know, people that just like you're going to become one day. I wonder how they're doing. Because let me tell you, this is the type of case that will never leave your heart, your mind, or your soul. This will visit you on the beach when you're with your own children, or Christmas, or Hanukkah, or other special family occasions, or Fourth of July, or when you're taking a long drive down a lonely stretch of road. They made a mistake. They killed my brother. It doesn't mean they're bad people, but they need to come to terms with it. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you from a family perspective as a guy now who, again, through no plan of my own, goes out and teaches doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals, as well as lawyers and risk managers and insurance companies and hospital and medical leadership, how to work with people like me when something goes wrong, not just for my benefit, but for your benefit as well. Because when something goes wrong, everybody's hurt. Everybody needs help. And running away and not saying anything, that doesn't do anybody, anybody any good. And it leads to more hurt and harm. So as I teach this, and I teach this all across the country, let me get my slides back, please. One of the, um, I often like to start with a case. 
This is a true story given to me by a risk manager out of California. I'll read it to you really quick. Mrs. Woods is a 53-year-old woman who goes to the hospital for CT-guided biopsy to the liver. Mrs. Woods believes the test shouldn't be a big deal, so she tells her husband to go to the mall across the street and do some shopping. The technician assures Mr. Woods, her husband, she will call when the test is complete. Mr. Woods is standing in the mall when a cell phone rings. He answers to hear a nurse frantically screaming, come quickly! When Mr. Woods gets back across the street, he learns his wife is dead. Folks, I'm Mr. Woods. Let's just pretend I'm Mr. Woods. I was going to take my wife out for dinner tonight, maybe go to a movie. Instead, I'll be picking out caskets. Talk to me. Talk to me. What are you going to say? Any thoughts? I'm sorry. Okay. What, in what context is that sorry going to be? How is, how is that going to sound? Is it, I'm sorry you screwed up and you owe me a million dollars? Or is it, I'm sorry this happened and we need to figure out what happened? Other thoughts? Are we going to talk about informed consent? Are we going to blame somebody? Or are we just going to keep being quiet? Because every moment that passes without you saying something, without you getting back in that leadership role, because you all been trained to be doctors, nurses, vets, dentists, whatever. What you're really being trained here at The Ohio State University is how to be a leader in someone's health care. You're being trained to be a leader in somebody's health care. And you know, health care loves to talk about how you know, things go great, and we're top 100 hospital according to some survey you never heard of before, high fives, our docs and nurses are wonderful, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's all great. You know, that's, that's the good side of leadership. That's when the sun's shining. Real leaders earn their keep when the chips are down. And every moment that you do not get back in the leadership mantle is a number of the moment that passes that says the relationship with you and me may be broken forever, and I'm going to come get you. Anybody want to take a shot? Because this may be you five years from now or ten years from now. At some point in your career, something like this will happen or happen to one of your colleagues or friends. Here's the deal. The medicine has failed us. The science has failed us. This case, put the slides back up, please. This case is meant to trick you in a way, not in a bad way, like ha, ha, ha. It's meant to suck you in so where you, the automatic presumption is somebody screwed up, right? It's supposed to be a routine test, right? They're supposed to go to dinner tonight. It's over and done really quickly. But she's dead now. Yes. Do we know the nurse has, yeah, we know that, yeah, okay. yeah, it, it's, it's, it's the right people, yeah, okay. it's the right people, and he's standing there right in front of you with his mouth, his jaw hitting the floor, maybe sobbing, maybe crying, maybe with her and held her hands and cried with her. They comforted her. When the moment was right, they said, do you have a ride home? Can we get you, can we get you something to eat or drink? Can we help you call your children? How can we help you? We're doing that review but we need to help you right now. Do you need a minister, a rabbi? Taking care of the needs. You, you only know two things. You've got a dead patient, upset family, upset clinicians. Simply say what you know when you know, and I'm sorry this happened, and meet immediate needs. You don't need to start speculating about informed consent or, or what might have happened or didn't happen or the technician's an idiot or the nurse didn't pay attention or that doctor. Oh, that doctor. You don't need to get any of that stuff. You simply need to take care of their needs right now. Give my slides back, please. So here's the challenges we see in disclosures. I teach disclosure across the country. One is getting this message that I just shared with you, and I'm going to share with you further as we go along over the next 35 minutes, getting it down to everybody in the organization, having consistent ethics in all cases. I was talking with some of your risk people earlier today, some of the risk managers and attorneys that work with Wexner Medical Center. And, you know, it's not uncommon to, to have people like that understand this. But folks like you that are going to be clinicians, frontline clinicians, the message hasn't gotten down to you. 
And it's not your fault. That's why I'm here tonight, so that we start this message here in medical school. Because I work with people that are your seniors, your you know, people 20, 30 years north of you, that never got this in medical school or nursing school or any type of healthcare school. Instead, what they were told back in the 1980s and 1990s was when something goes wrong, shut up. Don't, literally, shut up. Don't say anything. Get away from the family. If they start asking questions, call legal and get the heck out of there. If you want to write a prescription for you getting sued, follow that order. If you want to get sued, if that is your life goal, when you leave here, with all your debt and all the other stuff, if you want to get sued and you want to get called by the state, you want to have people blast you on social media, run away from your patients and families when something goes wrong. I promise you it will happen. I'll maybe even get called by some of your patients and families. I'll help them come get you. So pushing that message down to the frontline staff and then hitting the finish line. One of the things I often get from doctors and nurses is, well, if we hurt somebody or killed somebody, we really did bad and it was our fault. We made a mistake. They got to sue us, right? They, they gotta, they gotta, we got to go through this whole awful process. No. Because you and your hospital insurance company can work together to address my needs without all that fuss and fight. And when you get out there in healthcare, I hope you find, and this may be one of your interview questions, when you are talking, wherever you go work three, four, five years from now, one of your questions to them should be, hey, I'm involved in an adverse event two weeks from now. What's that looking like? What kind of support am I going to get? What are you going to tell me to do? What are you not going to tell me to do? And how are you going to take care of me as a person? Because I'm going to be hurting too, maybe more than the family. And then shut up and let them talk. And if I made an error, are we going to clean it up? Are we going to take care of that family? Are we going to meet their financial as well as emotional needs? Or are we going to play a tap dance to the courthouse? Ask those questions. Here's our agenda today over the next half hour, and I'm going to have to motor a little bit. Am I still okay on sound back there? It's a big room. I want to make sure. I'm going to give you what I call the five key facts every clinician should know about disclosure. Wherever you go, when you're done here, and whatever it is you do, Every one of you can use this, no matter who you end up working for or working with or you own your practice or whatever. It doesn't matter who your insurance carrier is because all this is about is getting connected pre-event and staying connected post-event. Getting connected with your patients and families, your customers, before something goes wrong and then working really hard to stay connected after something goes wrong. If you can do that simple thing, folks, it will knock out the vast majority of problems that might lead to lawsuits, trips to Columbus to talk to regulatory people, or dealing with the media and social media stuff. If you can get connected and then run to the fire. Slides back, please. There will be things that do go forward as a case, because it's a big injury or a death or the family's really upset. You'll be in a better spot to take care of it if you do this. And then ultimately, it's got to be a program. Every one of you will go work for some healthcare organization. You may be the leader in a healthcare organization one day. You may own a healthcare organization one day. Wherever you are on that pecking order, it is your job to make sure that your organization has a disclosure program where you actually have a, not only a policy, but a way of taking care of these things. Because when I go speak to hospitals, they all got plans on how to deal with a fire, earthquake, tornado, even a terrorist attack. Things that really never happen to hospitals or healthcare organizations. But very few have an actual plan and a program to deal with an adverse medical event, yet those happen every day. Slides, please. So here's the five key facts. Here they are right here. Again, it's all about getting connected, pre-event, staying connected, post-event. Let me go into this. First one is disclosure is good for clinicians. I believe when teaching disclosure, you have to make a business case to folks like you. Because if I ask you to list some of your concerns about becoming a healthcare professional, I imagine most, if not all, of you would list being sued or getting complained to the state about you is one of your concerns. It might be your top concern. Surveys of healthcare professional students have said time and time again it's one of their top concerns. Sometimes it drives people out of medicine. I guarantee your colleagues who are already graduated from here and are out in the field, it is a big concern of theirs. Am I going to get sued? Could they take my house, my car, my kid's college education fund? Are they going to take my license from me? Folks, I believe we need to address that. And the best way to address that is with this thing called disclosure. When you run to the problem and stay connected with me, we have a better chance to fix our problems. And if I still turn around and sue you, 
you look a heck of a lot better. Because a trial lawyer, a personal injury lawyer, the kind of person who might sue you, they love it when you run away and hide. Let me repeat that. A person, a lawyer who may sue you, loves it when you run away and hide. Because you make their story for them. Then go to a jury, then go to whoever and say, look, he's guilty because he ran away and hid. And he's a really bad guy because he didn't help this poor grieving widow and the little crying children. That's how the game's played. So lots of organizations around the country, your friends at that place up north, University of Michigan, I know it's a bad word here. I know where I'm speaking. I grew up in Cincinnati. I understand all about the Ohio State of Michigan thing. They're one of the best disclosure programs in the United States of America. They've cut their lawsuits in their hospital by over half. They've reduced what they spend on lawyers by over two-thirds. University of Illinois Medical Center, another Big Ten peer institution, they have similar results, similar data. When you run to the problem and stay connected with patients and families with empathy and, if necessary, apology, you fix problems. This is a great way to do, reduce lawsuits. It naturally improves quality and safety. The best way to, le best way to learn from a, a situation is to talk about it. And the big thing, I think the big sales point, when I talk to healthcare professionals, the big reason we do this, you know, at the end of the day, we, we got insurance to cover the lawsuits, right? That's fine. But in doing this work, it's been very cathartic to talk about my brother's death. But it's been an eye-opener for me, too, personally. Because I have learned how folks like you suffer, too, after an adverse medical error. Sometimes you suffer worse than me. I've heard of way too many doctors and nurses who quit or retire early, walk away from their careers, or they go home and take it out and their spouse and kids divorce, abuse children, or they blow their brains out, they commit suicide. All because they were involved in this very emotionally traumatizing thing called a medical error, and then no one helped them emotionally other than telling them to shut up. And they chew themselves alive. That's wrong. Just because you made a mistake doesn't mean you're a bad clinician. It means you're a human being who made a mistake. You're still a very well-trained person. We need to get you right personally and then get you back doing the job that they're training you to do so well here. Any good disclosure program has support for people who were involved in an adverse medical event. Again, that's one of your interview questions. Remember, an interview is two-way street, right? You're not just trying to get a job. You're trying to see if this is the job for you. Great question. Because let me tell you, I can't tell you how many doctors and nurses tell me they are hung out to dry when something goes wrong. And it chews them up personally, financially, their marriages, their kids, everything. Because the hospital, the insurance company won't help them. So you all smart kids. That's how you got in here. As you go out the door, think about this. Make it one of your questions for them. Slides, please. So number one, disclosure is good for you guys. Number two. We build those great relationships pre-event. The best way I can summarize this, folks, is if, if you're a jerk, if you're mean, if you're nasty, if you dump all over your colleagues, if you're rude to the patients and families, if you're just that arrogant, egotistical, you know what, because you're so smart and so great, God's gift to health care. And we've seen those people, right? And then all of a sudden, something bad happened, and you're down on bended knee. I'm so sorry. Is that going to sell? That's going to be like you're trying to avoid a lawsuit. I won't listen to it as a family, but if I like you, I think you're a good person, a decent human being, you're humble, you're good at your job and you're good to me, I might just listen. The interesting thing is, in healthcare today, one of the biggest pushes is this whole patient experience thing. It's not just what we treat you with, it's how we treat you. You know, the mints on the pillows, the clean bathrooms and stuff like that. How quick we pick up the phone. So as you get into healthcare, you're gonna find this is already happening. There's a big push on it. Or the government doesn't pay as much money. But this wraps into your litigation picture as well. How you treat me before something goes wrong wraps into your litigation picture. After my brother died, my parents came to my apartment one weekend. We spent a whole weekend, me and my laptop computer, listening to mom and dad about what happened to my brother Jim. 22 pages later, a single space, I had it all down, start to finish. A lot of bad medicine in there, but a lot of bad customer service too. 
doctors and nurses being goofy to each other and being goofy to our family. We made that organization look dysfunctional to capital D. Our attorney loved it. This customer service stuff, it gets into everything. Slides, please. Informed consent is part of this, too. Having those conversations before you do something to somebody, having an honest discussion, sitting down and spending the time, even though I might not listen or I might have unreasonable expectations, still spending the time and maybe even scaring me because sometimes the best procedure is the one that doesn't happen. And if you're going to do disclosure and it's a known event, known adverse event, and you're going to disclose that, boy, I hope, I hope your informed consent was good because you actually can fall back on that. So we have an adverse event. We have an adverse event. We had a great relationship with these people pre-event. They liked us, we liked them as a team. Now we've got this adverse event. Maybe a mistake, maybe not. What we know is we've got an upset family, upset patient if they're still alive, and then you all are upset. What are we going to do? How are we going to handle that? Remember the first case we talked about. Slides, please. Empathy. I'm sorry this happened to you. I feel bad for you is one thing. I'm sorry I made this mistake, it's all my fault, something entirely different, that's apology. Empathy is appropriate 100% of the time. Look at these two phrases, both use the word sorry. Both include the word sorry. Traditionally in healthcare, in any communication majors in here, or former communication majors will probably tell us 85% of communication is what? Not what you say, it's how you say it. And people who are traumatized may remember nothing of what you say, but they'll remember the look on your face and how your body was positioned. They'll remember that. My mother will never forget the look on the doctor's face when she confronted him. Pie eyes, turn around, ran the other way. Never forget it. So the question is, how do you want to be remembered after something goes wrong? What memories are you going to leave with your patients and families? Customer service elements, that's a great way to stay connected. You know, Doctors and nurses are fixers. You all fix things. You're type A personalities. You know, you run to the crisis, right? Except the medicine has failed us here, right? The medicine has failed us. The science has failed us. But you can still be a fixer. You give me a cup of coffee. You give me a, get, make sure I get home safe. You can call my, my minister. You can do all sorts of things to feed your need to be a fixer. And the cool thing is when you do that for me, it makes me think you really care. And those things are really gold. I mean, they're, they're, they're really insignificant as far as money or whatever, but they are gold. It shows you care. Again it's, again, it's all about staying connected. We do not admit fault. If you think you made a mistake, if you think a colleague made a mistake, if you think the team screwed up, we don't go there. And I'm not just doing this for your benefit and the benefit of your future employers or the fu your future practice you may own or hospital you may run. I'm doing it for my benefit. Because the worst thing we can do to Megan here is go out and say, yeah, we killed your loved one. It's all our fault. We screwed up. And then three weeks later, we come back, or three months later, we come back when the review is done and say, remember how we said we killed good old mom? Well, actually, we didn't. It wasn't our fault. We didn't make a mistake. It was, it was unrelated to the care. Think she's going to believe us? Not a chance. She thought we were ethical and great three weeks ago. Now she thinks we're a bunch of scumbags who've lowered up. And even though she's got the chart which shows there was no mistake, she'll take that to 20 law firms and they'll all tell her, uh, nothing. She'll write letters to the editor, call the state, she'll go nuts. And she'll drag you down with her. I've talked to people like that. It is a horrible spot to put a patient and family. Do not go there. Do not do that to them. Say what you know when you know it, when the immediate aftermath of an event. Even if you think you've got a strong hunch somebody screwed up, just simply I'm sorry this happened. We need, like my man said over there, we need to review, figure out what happened, and we'll get back to you. And how can I help you now? Because often in these cases when docs think they made a mistake, someone comes in with a clear set of eyes like, mm, not really. Or yeah, it was, but the mistake didn't have causation. So take your time. Be quick to empathize, but pause before apologizing. Slide. How do you, you need to document these things? Stick to the facts. Stick to the facts. Don't spec when you write in a medical chart, don't ever speculate or joust or write nasty things about the patient, family, or your colleagues. In this case, with a disclosure discussion, just simply say we met with Megan and her family at two. We talked about the following. We're going to meet again at 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. Turn the page or scan down. There it is. Next slide. 
So number one, disclosure is good for you. Number two, we build great relationships pre-event with good customer service. Number three, we save those relationships with empathy and more customer service. Number four, we call somebody. We call somebody. Who are we calling? They'll tell you who to call. You'd be calling leadership, the insurance company, the risk manager, or your department head, whoever. You're calling somebody to get help. Because the thing, if you want to drive your future boss crazy, do this. Here, it's really cool. Do this. Let's have a medical error on January 20th, okay? And don't tell anybody. And then let them find out six months from now when Elk and Elk calls and says, hey, the Smith family is in my office. We need the records. Who's the Smith family? And the risk managers running around saying, who's the Smith family? Megan, did you treat the Smith family? It's a, it's a train wreck at that point, folks. If you want to tick off your future employer, do that. Do that. You'll get the organization sued and maybe get yourself in a whole bunch of hot water. When something goes wrong and you've empathized, call afterwards. You may call before to get the, you know, a refresher on empathy or to get some help, or they may say, hey, you're not the right person. Go talk to Megan and her family. We'll send someone else. We call. Next slide, please. So call. And the last of the five key facts, train everybody. Y'all, I feel you're all going to be leaders in your organizations. That's great. But this is everybody issue. This is frontline staff. This is everybody that has a touch or a feel. You know, CNA is everybody. Because one of the biggest calamities that happens is, you know, patient gets hurt, they stay with the organization, the doc doesn't want to talk about it, or the doc moves on, and then who's left to pick up the mess? The nurses, the other staff. And if they haven't been trained on this, it's a train wreck, right? Because the family start pushing them, right? Family start pushing and banging away. So they may avoid the room like a nuclear waste dump, or they might go in and say something like, yeah, the doctor is an idiot. I get a lawyer. It's true. So make sure everybody in your organization is trained on this. Slides, please. So again, there's the five key facts. Those little note cards you got on your, hold those up, please. Yeah, those. Everything I talked about is based on those five key facts in there. The cool thing, again, as I said, as I said, everything that's in the five key facts, it's about getting connected pre-event, staying connected post-event. I don't care what organization you work in, you can do that. It doesn't matter how your insurance is carried or who's your lawyer or whatever. You can do that. It's all about simple common sense stuff. It's not about admitting fault. We don't do that. Not yet. So we've got about five, ten more minutes here. We'll finish up. How do you resolve a case? Because as I said earlier, one of the questions I often get from folks like you is, well, Doug, if we really hurt somebody, if we cut the wrong leg off, or we missed a heart attack, or we had a bad delivery of the baby, or we killed an animal, or whatever it is, and we really hurt somebody, killed somebody, they still got to sue us, right? They got to come after us, and it's got to go through this whole mean, nasty process. No. Again, this is why healthcare organizations today are developing disclosure programs. And as you go out, and you've had this message now, and your, your faculty and staff are going to reinforce on you, when you get out of here and go into healthcare organizations, you're going to be part of that reinforcement. We need, we need to have a programmatic approach to this. And the end game of any disclosure program is resolving a case. So I like to keep it simple. How do you resolve a case using this approach? And again, when you're at this point, this is not you, the frontline clinician, doing this by yourself, because you've already called, right? You've already called. Sorry this happened, Megan. We're going to do a review. Get on the phone. Hey, we got a problem with Megan and her family. I need help. Okay, great. So it comes down to three steps. Step one we've kind of talked about. The empathy, customer service, but no omission fault. We pause. We pause what? To do a review. To figure out what happened. You know, again, as a guy who lost a brother to medical errors, I'm all about folks like you apologizing and compensating and taking care of me financially as well as emotionally. But I, when I teach this, as I'm teaching you, I believe that is only coming to me when I deserve it. I don't think that every bad outcome in a hospital or healthcare setting is compensable. I don't think every time a family is unhappy, we just throw money at them, because that's not fair to you guys. You work very hard to get in these seats, you're going to work very hard while you're in these seats, and you're going to work even harder when you get out there in the profession. 
And I don't think doctors and nurses should be told to fall on the sword and apologize every time something bad happens. You should empathize all the time. You should always be empathetic to your customers. But we only apologize when a review has shown that you breach the standard of care, when you made a mistake, when you had a bad day. So let's, let's look at this. Here's some thoughts on how to do a review. And again, these are thoughts I hope you take with you because the review's got to be credible. It's got to pass the old smell test, if you will. Involve outside experts. You should never come back to Megan and her family and say, well, we didn't screw up. It wasn't our fault. Well, how do you know that? Well, we had our nursing manager look at it. We had one of our doctors on staff look at it, Megan. He decided we did okay. Is that credible? No. Get the type of expert any competent lawyer would find. Move quickly. When you're doing a review for somebody, move quickly. The longer it takes, the less I believe you. The longer it takes, the less I believe you. The more I think you're cooking the books. Stay in contact with patients and families. Here's a really important lesson, guys. Here's where a lot of hospitals and healthcare organizations fall down. They may do the empathy piece great. They may say, we're going to do a review, get her a cup of coffee, get her squared away. And then the review comes, and it takes five months. Five months to figure out if it's a complicated case, it might take that long. And while that five months is passing, nobody's talking to her. Nobody's picked up the phone. Nobody's sent her an email. Nobody's checked out. And why? Because we had nothing new to report. Here's a great article for you to read. Here's a great article for you to read. It's called As She Lay Dying. As She Lay Dying. It was in Health Affairs, I think it was December 2012. As She Lay Dying. It was written by a physician who lost his mom to medical errors. Horrible adverse event. It took the hospital four months to figure it out. During that four months, nobody called him or his family because he lived a couple states away. And the article starts out with, I'm not a lawsuit-prone person, but... And it talks about how more and more frustrated his family got because nobody stayed in touch with them. And he called the hospital, no one would call back. He called the hospital, no one would call back. He called the hospital one last time and said, if you don't call me, I'm going to sue you. If you don't call me, I'm going to sue you. Finally, somebody calls back and says, oh, we're, we're sorry, we didn't have all the facts together. We weren't ready to talk to you. Come on, guys. You don't need to have all the information ready to stay in contact with me. And it could be nothing more than saying, Megan, just touching base with you. How you doing? Here's where we're at in the process. Here's where it's going. Do you have any questions of me? Is there anything we can help you with? It might be a two-minute conversation. Or she might have some legitimate needs we can help with. Great. We're going to stay connected. And as part of slides, please, as part of staying connected, at, one, at some point we're going to say, Megan, we'd like to interview you. We want to get your perspective. And here's a mind-blowing thing that still not too many people in American healthcare know. When you're trying to determine if you made a mistake or not, it's not just about doctors and nurses and other people in healthcare talking amongst themselves. Another great way to find out is sit down and talk to the family. Because guess what? Thanks to our friend Dr. Oz. More and more people like her are coming into healthcare, and they got these little black books, right? And they're writing it all down. They're getting names. What kind of medicine you give my dad? What, what was the name of that test again? And what's your name there, son? Write it all down. They're, they're, they got exquisite detail. And in healthcare day, there's more and more handoffs, right? So what's the one constant? We're, we're watching it all. So why wouldn't you want to talk to me? I have an attorney friend who sues doctors for a living. He says, I don't know why they don't want it. Hospitals don't want to find out what's in that little black book. Because everything I need to litigate a case is there. So when you sit down, you can say, we just want to get to your side of the story. At the very minimum, that can be very empathetic. Because a lot of people that sue people like you, want another reason they say, what are the reasons? No one said they're sorry. No one took the situation seriously. Here's the other big reason. Nobody heard me. Nobody heard me. Nobody listened to my story. True. How often do you get in fights with your significant other? Your spouse, your boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, your parents. Because you just don't listen, right? Hell, I do it all the time with my wife. I just want to fix your problems and move on. And she just wants somebody to what? Listen. So if we sit down with Megan and say, tell us your story, at the very minimum, that can be very empathetic. She gets it off her chest. We might learn a lot, though, stuff that 
our colleagues didn't remember or just didn't want to tell us. We can learn a lot. Slides, please. If the review shows there's an error, you and your hospital, you and your insurance company, you and whoever, will set a meeting with the patient, family, attorney, apologize. And this is not empathy. Now we're an apology. I'm sorry we made the mistake because we've done the review. Explain what happened and how we're going to fix it, and then get into the compensation piece. And what that might look like is, Megan, again, we're sorry we hurt your dad. It's our fault. How do we make this right by you? And then shutting up and letting her talk. Because the cool thing is, folks, slides, please. <laughs> when you do this and you do this, you change the discussion from I'm going to own you, I'm going to own you in your facility, to what's fair for me. Everybody says America is a lawsuit happy culture. And I think we are a little more litigious than most countries. But you know what we also are? We're for very forgiving people. America is a very forgiving place. We really are. So long as you, slides, apologize. So long as you're accountable, I can meet you halfway. If you're not accountable and I have to come over and get you, well, now we've got a problem. You've got a big problem. And the cool thing is, in some of these cases, when you ask her what she needs, especially if you're dealing with the death of a child or senior citizen, it may have nothing to do with money. Nothing at all. It might be emotional fixes, memorials. I want to come back and speak at the hospital. I want to be involved in your safety efforts. But I'm not going to kid you. If you kill the breadwinner in the family, you'll be talking about mortgage payments, but I'd rather talk about it in this context than in a jury or a courtroom where it's out of your control. You guys can do this. It's happening in organizations. You're going to add to that momentum. Next slide. If there was no mistake, we don't pay. We continue to empathize. Again, we're sorry this happened. We did our review, and here's what the review showed. You are free to take it and share it with your attorney or whoever, and that's what we can do for you. And if she still believes we made a mistake or she's still mad at us, we say, well, we agree to disagree. Let us know any way that we can help you, and you leave it at that. Again, this has got to be a program. It's got to be a program. That's what's happening in organizations across the country. We're still very early on in the game. Most hospitals and healthcare and insurance organizations I deal with are still back at the starting line. So we're going to look to you folks who are basically being trained in this night, getting a very good introduction this night. When you get out of here in two, three, four, five years, whatever it is, to be people that go out and do this. Because again, it's not just important for me, it's important for you guys. Thank you very much. Okay, so I would like to introduce Dr. Chris Ellison, who is part of our panel uh, to finish the evening along with Doug and myself. And what we're going to do is share a few more stories with all of you about medical errors that affected us in some way. So I'm going to first talk about my youngest daughter and how she almost died as a result of medical errors in Australia. So we left Los Angeles. We were flying to New Zealand and Australia, and it was our dream trip. Uh, we were going to scuba dive, my husband and I, the Great Barrier Reef. My daughter couldn't wait to get over there and hold some koala bears. So we left Los Angeles. We were three hours from New Zealand, and Kaylin woke me up and said, Mom, I'm having terrible belly pain. And I said, What's, tell me more about that. Where does it hurt? She pointed to her belly button. I felt her forehead. She had a low-grade fever. And within a half an hour, she started vomiting. Now, what do you suspect in your differential diagnosis? This is of a 10-year-old at this point in time. What are you thinking? Appendicitis. 
is what I was thinking. So I woke my husband up and I said, John, I really think Kaylin has appendicitis. He said, you have got to be kidding. We're 33,000 miles up in the air, three hours from New Zealand. She was just fine. He said, Vern, don't you remember? I had a GI bug five days ago. I'm sure that's it. He said, you're just being the overprotective nurse practitioner mom. And I said, trust my instincts. We're taking her in as soon as we get to New Zealand. So we took her in there. I communicated what I thought she had. She had a work, work up at the medical center. They came back into the room and said, no, no. She doesn't have appendicitis. This is your husband's gastrointestinal bug he had five days ago. So they said, take her back to the hotel, watch her, make sure she stays hydrated. We did. Two days later, her fever dropped, her pain went away. My husband said, see, I told you so. I said, okay, I was wrong. We traveled to Sydney, Australia at that point. We were there four days touring. She had no fever, but she looked kind of punk and pale. I was filling her belly 16 times a day for rebound and for guarding to make sure nothing was there. We then traveled to the Australian Outback. How many of you have ever been to the Outback? There is nothing there, air's rock, right? Except this big red rock that you watch the sun settle on. Well, the third night we were there, she woke my husband and I up, groaning in her sleep. I felt her forehead, she was burning up. She had a hundred and four and a half fever. Said to my husband, we blew it. I knew it. She had early appendicitis that ruptured. That's when her pain went away. She dropped her fever. And now we're into a terrible abscess of a situation. We got to get the heck out of the outback right now. Took the next flight, flew to Cairns, Australia. That's where the Great Barrier Reef is took her right in, I explained to the docs in the ED, here's what I think happened, had early appendicitis, we missed it, now she's into an abscess. Nobody would believe me. She was an atypical case, she had a soft belly through this, a surgeon came in, asked her to jump up and down on her right foot with a 104 and a half fever. And I said, what's the evidence behind the jump on the right foot test here? But he then went on to explain, well, if there were peritoneal inflammation, she'd have pain and she wouldn't be able to do that. I begged them for an ultrasound of her belly. And do you know they would not do it because they didn't believe she had a belly problem because her belly was soft at this point. They called her a soft admission, even though her blood count, 33,000 white blood cell count, 92% neutrophilia, 36% stabs huge shift to the left that indicates a severe bacterial infection. I was labeled because the head nurse told me this after she got up to the beads unit, a stressed out nurse mom from the United States is what they labeled me. 16 hours went on, nobody still would listen to me. The eighth physician, finally, after Kaylin got back to Remick, was going into septicemia, 
tachycardic, up the wazoo, dropping her blood pressure. They're scratching their heads and saying, I guess we should get the ultrasound of her belly. They take her off to ultrasound, showed a big abscess in her belly. Surgeon comes back in the room, says your daughter's too sick to operate. So what we're going to do is put her on high IV triple dose antibiotics in the hopes the body will wall off that abscess. And that for six weeks, by the way. And then go in and do an elective surgery and take what's left of the appendix and the abscess out. I'm a former pediatric critical care nurse, and I was watching my daughter go septic. They tried to transfer her to the intensive care unit. There was no more beds there. And I'm sitting there as her mom saying our dream trip is turning into a total nightmare. Thank God for the pediatric nurse taking care of my daughter who said, Burn, you have the right to call in a private surgical consult. Would you like to do that? And I said, please, get me the best you have. So Ellen DeCostas came in, took one look at Kaylin, said, if we don't get her to OR now, we're going to lose her. And they flushed her peritoneum for over two solid hours because she was filled with pus and had full-blown peritonitis by then. So fortunately, my daughter made it through that, was hospitalized for over two weeks there, couldn't fly home for another week because her belly was so distended. But thank heaven she survived that. Only one doc came back to say I'm sorry. It was the surgeon who had her jumping up and down on her right foot. He looked at my husband and I and said, would you guys mind if I share Caitlin as a case in Grand Rounds this week? Because I never want to see another child go to this extreme and almost die as a result of us not listening to what you had to say. So Doug finished his talk by talking about that third condition. And it's that we don't listen. We have got to listen. That's part of the evidence-based practice, taking the best evidence from research, combining it with our clinical expertise and patients' preferences and values. We've got to listen to our patients. They know themselves. They know their family members. And we can't just cast away what they're saying to us. So that happened to us, thank God. My daughter lived. In fact, she was just accepted to vet school this year at Ohio State. So we're thrilled about that. Well, that's a hard uh, story to beat. I, you know, we should sign you up for the surgical uh, practice, I think, with that gr great diagnostic skill. So. I'm Chris Ellison, and I'm the interim dean of the College of Medicine and former chair of surgery at Ohio State for 14 years. Um, I, I think uh, if any of you in this room think that you will not ever make a mistake, you have just made a mistake, because you will. And I think that today's session, this evening's session, is really a fantastic preparation for what you may go through. Because, you know, we've done a lot of focusing this evening on the patient and the patient's family and the need to provide empathy and support for them. And it's critically important to do that because they do not understand the situation. They do not understand the complexity of the medical environment, the veterinary environment, the dental environment, optometry, and the other uh, interprofessional schools that are here. And they're in an unfamiliar surrounding. But I think oftentimes we forget that there's another victim when there is a medical error, and that is the healthcare team. 
that is the physician and the nursing staff and the medical student uh, and the nursing student that has been involved with that patient's care. It's the dietitian that had brought them food uh, for the several days prior to the illness that required surgery or whatever. So all of these people have an emotional investment in uh, the patient. And all of us will do that because the reason we go into this field is to help people. We are fixers, as Doug had indicated, and we want to help people solve problems. But we also are type A people, and we're very hard on ourselves when there is a complication, or we're very hard on ourselves when we make a mistake because we are A students in everything that we do, you know, 95 plus percent or better. Uh, and we don't tolerate uh, for ourselves uh, making errors. So I think that uh, a very good program that we've developed at the medical center is called the STAR program. And really, it has to do with stress recovery uh, for uh, physicians, uh, team members when they are involved with emotional situations. A patient comes in and, you know, if you make an error, that's an emotional situation, for example, particularly if there's a death or a bad outcome. Or it could be a patient that came in and was there for two or three weeks and was recovering and then had a turn for the worse. There wasn't a medical error per se, but still it's stressful on the uh, healthcare team. So I think that you know when you're in your environment uh, and you're dealing with patients and you've made a mistake, take a step back after you've gone through the steps that we've talked about this evening and. Think about yourself. How has this affected you? How is this going to affect your family? Um, what steps can you take to um, get help? And I'll, I'll share with you an example. So um, about uh, three years ago, uh, one of our anesthesiologists was involved with a uh, very bad outcome. Uh, and um, he it ended up being a litigation situation. And uh, I, we were discussing it at our risk management uh, committee and made a determination that um, we would uh, settle the case. Uh, and, uh, but still, it required a huge amount of emotional investment by, by this physician. Uh, and um, several months into this process, we, it dawned on us that there were, the person was having some emotional problems all in response to this uh, situation. So I picked the phone up and I called him and I said, can I come and meet with you? And I, can't, I met with him and we talked for an hour and a half. And he cried and he wept and uh, I have never quite seen you know, any reaction like this before. But when I left the room, he said, thank you because no one has paid attention to me in this whole thing. My life has been ruined. My wife has left me. Um, you know, I am a victim as well. And so I think that's something to take home this evening that we didn't get a lot of time to talk about. Uh, but it's very, very important to think about the people that you work with when medical errors occur. So thank you. To follow up on those comments, you know, I did mention in passing, I want to reinforce it now, because very valuable comments. You know, when you leave here, two, three, four years from now, whenever you're done here and you go on to wherever your next step is, you're going to work for somebody, get into practice, whatever it is, remember what I said. You know, an interview is a two-way street, gang. You're trying to convince them you're fantastic. They need to convince you that they are fantastic. And this is a great way to find out how really good they are. Because, you know, it's easy to feel good about each other when the sun's up, right? You know, everyone's high fi and you're all champions. woo -hoo, yeah. How are you going to be treated when the chips are down? And, and, and what is that going to look like? And shut up and let them talk. You know, if I'm involved in a medical error one year from now, I make a mistake, and we know it's a mistake. Or I'm involved in an adverse event, and I've got concerns about the care I was given. I'm really concerned about my patient and family. I'm concerned about me. How are you going to take care of me? And see what they say. 
because I can tell you, healthcare organizations across the country, they're all over the board on this. Some are absolutely terrific. They, they've got this, they've got this in place, and they're really sharp about it. Some, they're still back at the, uh, the starting line and everything in between. So you need to make a determination about that because, you know, it, it's important to you. You know, at the end of the day, you know, healthcare workers are in short, you know, are, are in short supply. You know, if you're good at what you do, you can pretty much go where you want to go. So you really need, you know, it's more than just the money and is there a pretty view out my office window? How are you going to be taken care of when something goes wrong? Because that's what's really going to determine, because it's going to happen. And one of your stories in your packets was about a woman who was at a hospital and if I just remember my facts right, she goes in the emergency room complaining of chest pain, right? She gets a full workup, x-ray, all that good stuff, and they don't find anything, the pain subsides, she goes home. She comes back four years later, same hospital. This is Allegiance Hospital in Michigan, by the way, it's a true story, an hour outside of Ann Arbor. She comes back, and what does it say? Well, you, know, you don't have a heart attack, but that spot has grown substantially since four years ago. What spot? That was a true story. And you talk about you know, staff being victimized. This was one of their own. This was actually Allegiance's hospital chaplain. It's actually a husband-wife team. It was the wife, but they were both chaplains for the organization. And you know, I shared that we, I wanted you to get that story because it was kind of like my first slide. The automatic presumption is what? We screwed up, right? Well, maybe not, because maybe she just didn't listen four years ago. Turns out it was truly a mistake. She was given that x-ray. Radiology saw that, hey, we got a problem here four years earlier, but nobody reported it down the line to her or to her primary care physician, primary care physician or even the folks in the ER. So the ball got dropped, four years passed. They obviously see it again. It's much, much bigger, and that, by that point, it's terminal. So it was a really fascinating story, and, and you know, a lot of the themes that I talked about in my presentation that you'll hear from people all across the country when it comes to patient safety and what do patients and families want when something goes wrong, what do clinicians want, were prevalent in that story. These two chaplains, they were in their early 70s. Their kids were raised. You know, they told the hospital, we don't want your money. Money's not important to us. We're people of God. This, you know, our kids are raised. What, we don't need money. What we want is to know this won't happen again. And the big thing they worked on before she passed was to develop a video about her story. And then, in, you know, she was on the video, her husband was on the video, the CEO of the hospital, other staff clinicians were on the video talking about this woman's case, what had happened to one of their own, about the mistake, but also about how they acted about that mistake, how they disclosed, they apologized, and they're trying to learn from it so, so it won't happen again. They've shared that throughout their organization, and they shared it with us at Sorry Works, and we turned around and shared it with the world. So a very powerful story. If it's something you're interested in seeing, go to sorryworks.net, send me an email, and I'll send you a link. It's a really terrific example of the good that can come out of a tragic situation. Just because there's a tragedy, an error, a mistake, someone's injured, someone's killed, it doesn't mean the end of the road for the family, it doesn't mean the end of the road for you. You know, it's all about how you pick yourself up off the deck and proceed forward. Hopefully tonight we've given you some of those tools that you can start that process. Just one, can I add one more thing on that, Vern? Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Moffat Bruce, I think, is, is here. Maybe she left, I don't know. Oh, there she is. So she is our chief quality officer, and she will know the case that I'm going to talk about. And a patient uh, had a serious fall in the hospital and ended up uh, with you know, significant complications. And uh, in, in the process of working with the family, um, the family said, we would like to help and uh, per have this uh, problem prevented in the future and came up with a wheel that they developed and designed that they put on the patient's door in the hospital. So if any of you go through Wexner Medical Center ro rotations, you'll see on the door is a disc, if you will, that rates the patient's uh, potential to have a fall. And this was all generated from a bad incident that was preventable, that ended with a bad outcome, 
but engagement of the family uh, really led to something new. And they uh, have contributed to the medical center in many different ways uh, to help us make our uh, safety uh, uh, better and quality better in the medical center. So again, something good came out of something bad. And it's just, I mean, human, uh, the human element is truly incredible uh, when it comes to these types of situations. So, Bern. So I'll just finish by relating that if you or a family member go to the hospital today, you stand a one out of 10 chance, one out of 10 of having a medical error happen to you. And if you have a medical error happen to you, five to 15% of you will either die or have permanent disability. That is really something hardcore fact to keep in mind because again, why do these errors occur? So often they occur due to lack of teamwork, lack of communication, lack of evidence-based practice. So it's our hope, and I really wanna thank Doug and Chris and Michelle, everybody who helped plan this event and our faculty facilitators and you students for being here with us tonight for this awesome seminar. We want you to remember people do not know how much you know until they know how much you care. So we hope you take these concepts with you tonight. They don't just leave you after you walk out the door, but you make caring, empathy, sorry, part of your framework as you progress through your academic programs. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Please fill out your surveys that you'll be getting this week. And last but not least, go Bucks!